Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited. Um, so excited. Let's, get, let's see. It's just after uh, three o'clock my time. It's noon in California, um, but we will get started because we have a lot to cover, but we just want to say hi. And as people come in, I will continue to um, admit them. But uh, Aisha, welcome. So, so good to see you. I miss you. How are you? I'm good, and it's so good to see you. And hello, everyone. Thank you for giving us your morning or your afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. Um, I'm just so looking forward to this conversation. And why don't you start with introducing yourself? Because you've had such an illustrious career in the oh. fashion industry. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, for those who don't know me, I started out, I guess, my fashion career, if you don't count the part when I was a consumer and buying way too many clothes, which was mainly my all of my teenage years. Um, <laughs> I started modeling in New York when I was in my early 20s and um, was thrown into the fashion industry that way, realized uh, there was a lot about the industry I didn't like um, and I didn't feel empowered at all. And they did not give me the platform I wanted to speak up about my values and my thoughts and my ideas. And so um, long story short, in not finding what I sought in modeling, I decided to create my own modeling agency, Role Models Management. And um, in that work, I, um, I started it when I lived in New York City, but then my husband and I, or he was my boyfriend at the time, we moved to San Francisco. And um, when I lived on the West Coast, I met some wonderful people, Aisha being one of them. And uh, we were actually at this one party, a sustainable fashion party, and we started talking and had so much we bonded over. And we said, let's uh, join forces and figure out what we can do to change this industry for the better. Um, so yeah, I guess that brings me to where I am right now. Yeah. And um, you know, continuously trying to bring awareness to the fashion industry and everything we need to do to make it better because it doesn't have to be a terrible industry. It can actually be a force for good, which you guys are all about. And I'm so proud for all the work that you continuously do in um, making it better for all the garment workers and all the women in this field. So yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and why you started Remake? Yeah, so hello everyone. I am Aisha Berenblad. I am the founder of Remake. We are an advocacy organization that's really focused, as Anne said, to make fashion a force for good. My own background in the fashion industry is having worked both on the inside, consulting with brands to get them to really be thinking about the climate and human rights issues within their uh, business and to be making the business case for them to be embedding sustainability into their core practices. I also worked for the International Labor Organization, more on the policy side, bringing governments, unions, and brands to the table to make working conditions better. And much like Anne, I have a love-hate relationship with the fashion industry. I love fashion. That's one of the first things Anne and I bonded on was just because it's a sustainable fashion party, why can't we look nice, you know, because it is fashion after all. And, you know, in all my years of working on the inside of the industry, I, like Anne, got impatient that we weren't making progress fast enough. And so I started Remake, where we essentially do three things. The first is focused on uh, transparency, so really building accountability, getting you to discover better brands, holding brands to better standards so that we can really buy our values. The second is focused on education. So we do a lot of events like this to get everyday people, citizens to understand and be a part of the sustainable fashion movement. And the third, I see some of our ambassadors, Anne is an ambassador as well, is our leadership development program. We work a lot on college campuses, increasingly even we have a demand and interest from high schools to get people to really understand and connect whether you care about climate, whether you care about gender, how you can be a part of making the fashion industry better. And so this today is our Sustainable Fashion 101 crash course. And you know we hope to keep it very interactive. I want to hear from you, shout out your disagreements. We want to have a conversation. We don't just want to speak at you. And so to get us going, one of the things I hope you all will do on the chat is just tell us what does the term sustainable fashion mean to you? And then I'm curious, when you hear the word sustainable fashion in like one sentence, how would you describe it? What is it? Because so many people have different definitions even of what sustainable fashion is. Oh, it's a good question. I guess sustainable fashion to me is fashion that sustains everything we care about, which is 
my style, which is my well-being, which is our health, which is the health of the planet, which is our economy. Um, it's, it's so en encompassing everything more than you know, beyond what materials we use or how we produce our clothes. It's about the people that make the clothes. It's about everything. So I think sustainable is such a broad word and sometimes overused, but it really also, like I said, just captures everything that we need to be caring about. So yeah, I guess it's, it's many things, but um, it's about sustaining things that we care about. Yeah. And I would love, you know, as I said, to, to hear from all of you what sustainable fashion means. I think in some ways it's become so confusing because brands have really co-opted our interest in sustainable fashion. There's a lot of greenwashing out there. And so when I think of sustainable fashion, much like Anne, I really think of the intersectionality of these issues. And I really think of two things. Sustainable fashion is about climate justice and gender justice. And if we could just get those two things right, then you have a sustainable fashion industry. And so to make clear what I mean by that, I wanted us to tell you three very quick stories. You know, the first is really the story of our clothes. And I think the reason it's so important is our clothes mean so very much to us. It's personal. You know, I remember being five years old, perhaps, and looking up at my beautiful, glamorous grandmother who had helped raise me. You know, she's donning this pajamina shawl to go out. And I was just in love. You know, so much, I think, for us as women, especially, is about how fashion makes us feel the empowerment of, you know, putting on that right power suit as we saw Kamala with her white power suit out there on the podium. And I'm curious, Anne, when you think about your clothes, what's the story you're trying to tell? I, for me, clothing is, it needs to be comfortable. I need to feel like a badass. And for many years, I felt like I had to be dressed a certain way to be fashionable. But then I realized I can wear a pair of oversized denim and a white t-shirt and feel absolutely like the most badass babe. So for me, it's about empowering myself in my own energy. Um, and fashion can, in that sense, mean so many different things. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, you know, the thing about fashion and the story of fashion actually starts here. Like, as you see this image, I think it just, it just evokes, gosh, look at the volume of stuff, right? And the Ellen and MacArthur Foundation has done some analysis to say that today we produce per year, 100 billion units of clothes. And to put that in context, there are just seven and a half billion people on the planet. And so the way any of us shop today is very different from my grandmother's generation. We're buying very many more clothes we're buying, we're wearing them for less than half the amount of time. And then we send it off, you know, perhaps to what we think is the right thing, a charity shop, a goodwill donation. But the truth is the volume of consumption, because there's just so much out there, most doesn't actually make it in the secondhand markets. It ends up in landfills. And so when I think of sustainable fashion, it's, you know, all of the waste at the end of the day, but also all of the natural materials, the, the precious earth, the, you know, the soil and the water and everything that goes into these clothes, whether it's a fast fashion brand or a luxury brand, the natural resources that go into it are exactly the same. And so, you know, I often get this question, well, Zara now has a conscious collection or H&M might have a conscious collection. Everyone is talking about sustainability. Does that make them sustainable? And you know, one way for you all just to smell the greenwashing is to say, okay, well, how much of the product they're putting out there in the world is sustainable or sustainably marketed? And how much of it is the other stuff? And the truth is for a lot of the brands, they're just tinkering on the edges, you know? So you'll often hear about sustainable materials, but you won't hear how much sustainable material. You'll hear about recycling efforts, but not actually how much ends up in landfill versus what's recycled. Um, and most companies will never talk about the volume of consumption. And if we are to really think about the climate and environmental impact, we just have to be making less stuff. Um, what do you think, A.T.? Like, how many things do you have in your closet? Um, I've downsized a lot. I feel like I still have too many things, though. But something that came to me when you spoke was, because, like, you talked about all these conscious collections, and I think those are the ones that are being highlighted in vogue, you know? It's like, oh, shop our conscious collection is the only thing we see. We don't, and, like, and by the way, we also have 
99% of our clothes being complete, complete crap and please buy that too. So that's not what they're pushing forth. And I think in that sense, it is such greenwashing. And one more thing, I remember seeing an ad for H&M of like Conscious Collection, this shirt, and it was still only like $9.99 for a t-shirt or whatever it was. And I'm like, how is that even possible? And like, even if it is consciously made, in what way? Because like, how are people being fairly like paid or treated making a garment that is that cheap? So yeah, there's more to it than just putting a sustainable tag on it. I mean, that's where the intersectionality comes in. You know, one of the other things that drives me absolutely crazy is all the brands that are now talking about putting plastic bottles into clothes, you know, and it's like, oh, we are saving so many plastic bottles from the ocean. And now we have the rocky shoes and we have the t-shirts and we have the jeans. Here's the thing. Plastic doesn't biodegrade. You know, anything that has plastic in it will end up in landfills forever and ever. And so you may have found a short term use by putting some plastic and it's a clever marketing campaign. But at the end of the day, if it has plastic in it, then, you know, it's going to sit in, in a landfill. It's going to bleach into our soils. It's going to get into our marine life. And so even when we talk about sustainable materials, what you're wanting to look for is really breathable, biodegradable materials. You know, the minute you've got anything with polyester in it, know that it won't break down. One of the things that people don't realize is the farm connection to cotton and that a lot of our clothes, the story of our clothes starts right here in the cotton fields. And, you know, for me, it was startling to realize how much water it takes to make just one t-shirt. It's 450 liters of water. And just to put that into context, because that is that a big number? Is that a small number? That's how much you and I would drink in terms of water for two years. Hmm. And being here in California, as someone who, you know, is used to the droughts and yelling at my kids to take shorter showers, and we've seen the fire damage, you just realize, you know, with all the voting merchandise that has been out there, you know, these are all disposable teas that someone's going to wear once and throw away. That's a lot of water. And, you know, the other thing that's really interesting about this conversation, we've talked a little bit about the unsustainable materials, plastic or polyester, but, you know, cotton is a very complicated story as well. Um, you know, currently there's over 1.5 million Uyghurs in the Western region of China that are essentially in forced labor detention camps. This is genocide and ethnic cleansing on the parts of the Chinese who in most of the fashion industry is implicated in this crisis with these Uyghurs both making our clothes, but also picking cotton. And it turns out that even some of the sustainably marketed cotton, even to last a better cotton initiative, a lot of that cotton was coming from that region. And so you realize you're trying to do the right thing. You buy something that says it's sustainable cotton, but it could actually be made with forced labor. When you buy and you think about material and what are the things that you're looking for? Well, I would say, I, first of all, I try to buy something that's already produced, so secondhand. Uh, and if I do buy new, I do look for natural materials, hemp, cotton, um, silk, wool. But it is hard because you don't, it's so hard as a consumer to like know, like, where does it end? And then you learn something new and you feel like, should I just stop shopping altogether? Right. Like, should I just never, ever buy new clothes? And yeah, it's, it's not easy. And I think we need to not shame ourselves, but thank you for bringing all these things to the table because there needs to be a lot more awareness. And I think, I mean, here's just my thought. Wouldn't it be better if instead of putting it on a consumer, having to make the right choices, there are some like actual right regulations and you know, laws install where like companies just can't do this. Like how is it even legal for companies to continue to pollute the planet the way they are um, in the fashion industry? Absolutely. And, you know, this is one of the things that we never talk about is just how deregulated the fashion industry is. And this is both from the countries that make our product, but also the countries receiving it. And that companies have really managed through subcontractors and layers and layers of that uh, really exploit the loopholes. You know, I wonder how many of you, you know, maybe just with a show of hands, think about organic food or try and buy things that are pesticide free because you care very much about the food that you eat and its connection to your health.
to an extent, you know, I mean, here in California, I know in New York, it's, a, but what's interesting to me is, did you know that there are over 8,000 synthetic chemicals that go into the treatment of our clothes and that the regulations here, to your point, Anne, in the U.S. are less stringent than in Europe. And we know, and as someone within the remake team that has spent a lot of time in dye houses, that that smell of the chemicals that are being put on clothes, the way that we distress jeans, you know, it has a, you can't be in these dye houses for more than a couple of minutes without just the bleach hitting your throat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have documented cases of the high rates of cancer because of the carcinogenic content of workers that are working in tanneries and in dye houses. And the health impact to us as everyday people is still unknown. But when you think about, you know, sweat wicking and you think about distressing and all the different ways that our clothes are treated, you know, when you buy something new and it has this very particular scent, I don't mm -hmm. know if you all have seen, you know, you buy something and you smell it and you're like, oh, that smells kind of chemically. That's formaldehyde. And the reason we put formaldehyde in our clothes is because it's often coming from China, from Southeast Asia, and it's a way for the clothes to not get mildew. The only other time we use formaldehyde is when we do burials. And so it's to sort of preserve the human body. And so, you know, a lot of this deregulation also has an impact on human health, whether it comes to the makers of our clothes or to the end customer. And so, you know, we trace this unhappy story of our clothes all the way from the cotton farms to the dye houses, to the cut and sew facilities. And then it's like, okay, and now it's coming to its end of life. And we already know that, you know, my average American is buying 68 more percent of clothes than we ever did before. And it's like, where does it end up? And, you know, it's been interesting in the pandemic because a lot of us, when we were sheltering in place or continue to shelter in place, people were Marie Kondoing their closet and Goodwill was reporting just bags and bags of clothes being left on their curbside. And, you know, there was sort of alarmist messages of please don't do that. You know, the secondhand markets at this point have been decimated because of the pandemic. Most of what you're doing is essentially making us responsible for your trash. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was only reading Adam Minter's book, Second hand where it was startling to realize you know he sat at a goodwill in Arizona for hundreds of hours just watching the volume of clothes that are coming and the truth is if it's torn if it needs to be mended if it's in bad shape you're really just using for goodwill as a dumping ground and feeling good about yourself but even for the better clothes you know they're really able to absorb only 10 percent the the secondhand markets of what we donate and then the rest ends up in places like Ghana, where, you know, there's picker markets and it's decimating their local economies and they're trying to get any sort of second life from our clothes. Um, but the, the truth is it just even within those markets, a lot of the countries are overwhelmed. It's, it's, it's too much. And, you know, then we're basically using these poor countries as dumping grounds for our clothes, because the idea is you can't see it, then you don't have to worry about it. And so at the end of the day, the story of our clothes really does come back to buying less, buying better, because regardless of the sustainably marketed materials, most of it is going to end up in landfills anyways. You know, I'm curious, A.T., how do you think of, you know, things you're done with? How do you get rid of them? What do you do with them? It's interesting you bring this up because I remember um, as we were moving from San Francisco back to New York last summer, I had to again do a little bit of a cleanse. I don't have a lot of stuff because we moved a lot, but I still was like thinking that there's some things I don't wear anymore. Let's walk around the corner to the Goodwill store and drop it off. And I remember like asking the guy, I'm like, what happens to these things if you don't sell them? And I'm like, do you throw them out? And he couldn't give me a right answer. And I'm realizing like, I'm actually just like you said, giving myself a better conscious of ridding my own stuff. And I don't even know what's going to happen with them. Um, so I think it's a really difficult question. I try to pass it on. I have friends that we would like swap clothes with one another. Um, my my sister-in-law's here in America. We continue to like, just circulate clothes as much as we can. I think that's a really good idea because just, like you said, we can't just think that by donating it, we're doing the better thing. Obviously, that's better than throwing it out. But there is another, there's more to it than that. So I think it's hard. And I, it's always, you know, one of those things where I don't want to get rid of stuff because I feel like I'm <laughs> guilty of getting rid of it. At the same time, I can't just hoard things. So I try to buy less to begin with, um, yeah. I guess my answer is nowadays. 
Yeah. And it's something I've been thinking a lot about with election season and, you know, some of the sort of girl power slogans, because a lot of those disposable merch, you know, it takes the same amount of resources, but it is going to end up in a landfill. So at least my rule of thumb is if I'm not going to wear it over and over again, like this black dress, I've had it forever. It's the kind of thing I can give a talk at, but I can also go out in the evening, back in the day when we used to go out in the evening, you know, and it's really having that sort of wardrobe that is more functional and flexible. So, you know, a very interesting, sorry, can I uh, just, there's a very interesting movement that, um, that I'm supporting too. Uh, it's upcycling um, fashion. And I have, I have some, well, friends brand that, that are, that are making upcycling. And so the clothes that I don't need anymore or they're damaged or something, but they're interesting. I can give actually to the brand and they will do something new with that. And mm. this is a very interesting part. So actually, if, if you guys don't know what to do with your clothes, but you, you can just do this research if in your city, there is a brand like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm curious if people have other ideas. We've heard of, you know, upcycling, there's also swap parties. But the truth is like anything that we can do as an individual is just, uh, you know, it's minimal. And so at the end of the day, in some ways, we have to stop feeding this beast, right? It's like, we're not going to really be able to upcycle 100 billion units of clothes. We're not going to be able to recycle them. And so to an extent, supporting the secondhand market, supporting the rental market, and and doing our part to slow it down is one piece of it. But I think to Anne's point, we do need legislation and regulation. You know, there has been some conversation around cities, for example, on should they be taxing brands when they have to deal with the textile waste, because at the end of the day, they're passing that cost on. You know, so one of the things um, I wanted to chat with you all about sort of as the end of this very dark story is, okay, so the story of our clothes comes from, you know, in some ways, terrible places. What's been happening to the people who are predominantly women who make our clothes during the pandemic? And so what's been interesting here is that through the length of the pandemic, we have had fashion brands claim that they are not wanting to take orders that are already produced or in production. In Bangladesh alone, at the beginning of the pandemic, they canceled upwards of $3 billion worth of orders. The estimates are that there was order cancellations globally, upwards of $40 billion. And so what this means is that, you know, the fabric had already been bought. In some cases, the clothes were already stitched. In some cases, they were already on ships arriving into Europe and the U.S., And then the fashion industry realized we're sheltering in place. We're maybe just buying sweatpants to be at home. Everyone is doing Zoom calls. I actually saw an interesting stat of people who are buying tops, but not bottoms. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so we were just buying less. And so the industry was trying to figure out how to cash shore up their cash flow, how to assure that they stay profitable during this economic slowdown. And so what they told their factories is we don't want it. And the way the contracts are written, it's so one-sided, it was very much to say, you know, we have hold all the power to not claim these goods. And just think about sort of the boxes and boxes of things that were made for the spring and summer that went to waste. But most importantly for us, which is why we launched the Pay Up campaign, millions of women who had used hundreds of untold hours to make our clothes, who had put in the labor, were not being paid their wages, out protesting on the streets. And this was around a time when COVID infection rates already rising. And so, you know, you have a clarity of who matters in the fashion industry and who doesn't. Because a lot of the brands who didn't pay up, who didn't do right by fashion's most essential workers, actually posted that we're doing okay when it comes to second quarter earnings. And the reason is that they showed up their cash by not claiming these goods for which they had put orders in already. And so, you know, that is sort of the long and happy story of our clothes, right? It's from the material to the environmental impact to the human rights impact. These are things that we all know. But, you know, one of the stories that never gets told that I think we need to increasingly tell in the sustainable fashion space is the story of the maker. 
you know, here at Remake, we don't like to use the word worker. I, I think it's quite dehumanizing. You know, garment work is high skilled work. If you've ever seen someone, whether working for a luxury Altier or working at a cut so factory for fast fashion brands, it's hard work, it's skilled work. And the truth is we don't value it. We treat it today as a cost center. And so one of the things that we at Remake were doing pre-pandemic is that we go around the world. We've been to India, to Pakistan, to Haiti, um, to bring you stories of the women who make our clothes. And I think as we think of sustainable fashion, you know, it's really centering her as the hero of the story. You know, I'd be curious if you put in the chat, if you've ever attended sustainable fashion events or conferences or Insta chats, who comes to mind? And, you know, I, I would reckon that it is a white influencer with very blonde hair who's talking about her upcycling and recycling, but we are never talking about the actual human beings, the millions of women who are in their early 20s, much like, you know, the age that many of us fell in love with fashion, who are actually feminists in their own right, who are often the first in their family to go to the big bad cities. You know, in the context of COVID, we've been weekly talking to workers. She's been out there, you know, being beaten up by the police, demanding her wages, organizing and demanding what's right, you know, very much organizing at a time when the system is failing her. And, you know, I dream of a day where we can really center the people who make our clothes and that's what will make it truly sustainable. You know, some of the things that she's up against time and time again that have been exasperated in the pandemic is gender-based violence. It's very often that if you're pregnant in the fashion industry, you get fired. It's illegal, but you do. And now that there is less orders and you know factories are trying to get things even faster because everything is happening on e-commerce, the instances of gender-based violence have gone up. You know, she's also often put on short term contracts so that they never have to pay into any severance funds for her. Um, she's often up against sexual harassment in the workplace because everyone supervisor and up is a man um, and often paid less than her male counterparts. And, you know, E.T., it's something you and I have talked about in terms of your career as a model, because what's fascinating about the fashion industry is here's a $2.4 trillion industry that is mostly profitable because of women. It's women's wear that keeps this industry profitable. So we're the ones buying. Um, we're also the ones making because it's a predominantly female workforce, but we're also the ones selling that image. And so as you think of your career as a model and what, what, what are the similarities in terms of the working conditions that comes to mind much like the makers of our clothes. Yeah, this is so interesting. We've talked a lot about this, but I think the first word that comes to me is disempowerment. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes across the whole spectrum. It's disempowerment for garment makers. Um, it's, and then it goes to the very other end of it, which is the models. As a model, may, many people may not know this, but you have very little power. Usually, at least it used to be that way. It's changing a little bit. Um, but as a model, you have no rights to say what you think or, you know, feel about something you are supposed to show up on time. If you feel like sexually harassed, like don't talk about that because no one wants to hear, you know, they're long hours, sometimes don't get paid for, for months, if not years, sometimes you never get paid for things you've done and you have no rights. And as an independent contractor slash employee slash nobody, <laughs> basically you have no rights. So you can be screwed by your agency. You can be held hostage under these really strange contracts. And so it is really disempowering and it's such a, also such a competitive industry where you don't want to risk losing an opportunity. So you just put up whatever, you know, you think you have to put up with so that you don't miss out because if you don't take it, someone else is going to be right behind you and take it for you. So I think what we don't really talk about is we have this massive industry, like you said, it's fueled by women, but in one sense, it's not really fueled by us either because we are told that we need to buy these clothes to, to look a certain way, to feel a certain way, to have a certain sense of power. We and so we comfortable, right? And right. for the longest time, men were making our lingerie and we know how uncomfortable Victoria's Secret is. <laughs> right? Anyone ever buying those clothes? I know, it's like, what? So like, do you know, so we have the left end, which is garment worker or maker. Then we have the models in the very far end of the other side. And then in the middle, we have the consumer, which is also pretty disempowered because we buy things that are even thinking about it. You know, many times it's not a conscious purchase. We feel like we have to, to be happy or to, to, you know, to keep up with fashion. So I think what we need to do is 
change all of it, you know, and turn it around and make fashion a force for good um, on all fronts for, for models, for garment workers, for, for the consumer. Um, and I think fashion could be this beautiful thing that empowers us, but we have to choose to make it such. So yeah, that's our story um, that we talk a lot about, which is a really interesting lens when you start to think about it model and maker you know to such far ends of the supply chain but yet this story of disempowerment and as anna said with uh, workers as well and you know one of the other things i wanted to debunk you know outside of that somehow the makers of our clothes are victims this is really mm -hmm. a story of a woman that is fighting against a system that's set to oppress her but fighting hard to push back on that. And if you're curious to see any of our documentaries on remake.world, you know, our Cambodia one is great, Sri Lanka, it just gives you a lens and a human voice and a face. But one of the things we thought we'd do right now is to show you our short Made in America. And the reason is, you know, so much of our politics right now, and it's come to a head to almost talk about sustainable fashion as if, if it's made in the US, it's all good. And you know, we have been in really close contact with some of our colleagues from the Garment Workers Center who represent the workers in LA. LA, by the way, is the largest production hub in the US. And it's been interesting to see sort of what is the story of Made in USA. And when you look under the hood, what actually happens. And so I'm gonna go ahead and play the short now. Um, hopefully the sound quality and everything with Zoom, it can be tricky. So I'll also put the link in the chat if that happens. But I'd love to just hear your reactions as you're watching this short. And then we'll come back and use the rest of our time around the third and final story, which is the story of all of us as empowered citizens, as empowered customers, and how we can all make a difference. So here it is. And always it's with the technical stuff, huh, Anne? Um, so if you guys will just give me a second, um, I'm going to hopefully pull it up and play it for you. But while we do that, I would love to hear from each of you just in terms of, you know, when you think of Made in USA, um, what comes to mind? And, you know, feel free to unmute your mics or- So you know, can you the question? Uh, when you think of Made in America, what comes to mind? Hamburger. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think about hamburger and about making people um, less conscious and, well, sorry, I'm not from America, but this is what okay. I have. Yeah. Yeah, other thoughts? Well, I would just say, I think like you said, made in America, it's almost like a greenwashing thing where you, immediately think that's better you know it's better working conditions and more sustainable and more consciously made than something made in asia for example yeah yeah um and i'm wondering if we could play the short but you know i really do want to get to the how like would people like to watch the short on their own time and for us to have more a conversation of okay here's the issues and what can we do or would you like to watch the short together how long is it it's 10 minutes what are people saying Want to watch it? That's a thumbs up. Or if you want to watch it on your own time later. All right. I guess you want to watch it. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Do you have it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have okay. it. I'm going to pull it out. But I think that's exactly the point that, you know, often there is the sense that it's made in America and it's wonderful. And that's, you know, the future of uh, fashion is to bring it all back home. And, you know, the truth is a lot more complicated than that. And yeah, I remember I actually went to a store once and I'm like, I was trying to fish for any insight. I'm like, what, you know, is this any sustainably made or something? And they said, well, it's made in America. And I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I understand the term. It's like made in Spain, made in France, made in everywhere where you are from. It's just to put some nationalist words to say this is made here. And so it's better because it's ours. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there's like a nationalistic pride to it, you know, which in some ways is quite dangerous because the women who make our clothes around the world need the money, you know. Yeah. So here, without further ado, um, we went undercover right before COVID. So I would want to make it clear that we're very safe. Um, undercover in downtown LA to bring you the voices of who makes our clothes in America. 
We're here today to celebrate American manufacturing. We're going to bring back Made in the USA. Made in the USA, Made in America, both pretty good. To kick off his Made in America push. When we think of Made in America, we remember our manufacturing heritage. And we think of the jobs that all of those wonderful inventions brought. That those cities have fundamentally changed. The work that they do is different and for apparel, it has gone to a workforce that is vulnerable and can be exploited. And that is different than what we imagine when we think of Made in America. All of these things that we imagine that could happen overseas can happen here, and they do. You walk into a factory in LA today, you're going to see men and women hunched over and pushing the clothing under the needle. Any woman that I look at, you know, she's definitely doing this for her family. She is providing income that they need. They're mostly from Latin America and Mexico, and there are some Asian populations. They face a lot of challenges here. I'm likely to see someone who's not getting minimum wage and they're going to be paid in cash to avoid tax obligations for the owner and it's just it's a very vulnerable type of environment Hello, my name is jenny originally from indonesia i love this world my mom is Stella. my father is Stella. My grandfather is Taylor, so I grew up with the machine. I left one kid in my country. I left him when two weeks to survive because I, I don't have a um, partner, so I have to write things. <laughs> The first time I worked, I was at Hot Garment Factory. The factory, they don't have lamp, they don't have tissue in the bathroom, nothing. Just doing work or hope as you can. Every week, she pay me 125. I don't know my rights. I don't know nothing. I remember when I first started doing this in the 90s and I was being trained and we were going into several factories a day in LA. We would walk in and I watched my colleague walk down the aisle of sewing machines and touch the empty machines to see if they were warm. So she would know if people had left when we walked in. And I think that really opened my eyes to the idea that whatever you see, there could be so much more. The factory, they are paying me different price with the other workers because I, I cannot communication with the other workers. So the lady was cheating on me a long time. I feel sad and angry, but in the same time, I can do nothing. I don't have any power. Made in the U.S., made in L.A., there's a very dangerous assumption that it's made ethically, it's made legally. It's hard for people to conceive that literally right down the street, people are working in sweatshop conditions, but we really need to highlight that problem and we need to clean this up. I didn't fully 
understand when I started this business that clothes were actually made by people. I really kind of thought there was an automated aspect to it. When I buy a tank top in the store, you know, most people don't stop and think, oh, there's actually a person behind this. I've been in the business about 10 years now, all in Los Angeles. So I've seen some developments with fast fashion. When it starts with the customer, it's part of a whole big system where people are not making a ton of cash themselves, but they are programmed in our consumer society to want, to want, to want, to want. And they can have it at H&M or at Zara for, you know, under 20 bucks. There's pressures. There is extreme price pressures on the industry thanks to the influx of cheap goods on the market, effectively. And cute cheap goods. They're not quality, perhaps, but that's what a lot of girls just want to wear at that once or twice. And it was already on my Instagram, so I can't, can't wear it again, you know? There is a cost to that. If you're, you know, consistently paying near nothing for your clothes, you need to stop and think, is somebody getting abused or taken advantage for my price point to be so low? The ethically made garment is, generally speaking, of higher quality, first things first, so it's gonna feel better, gonna look better, gonna wear better for longer. You also know that the people involved in the supply chain and the making of that garment were paid a living wage. I was working at a, in another place in LA, but different. Uh, they press you too much, too much pressing. They want more quantities, they want more production. They don't pay well, but here it's different. We have a culture here and it's, you know, well, well lit and well ventilated and they have a nice break room and we know each other and things like that. You know, these other big corporate companies are totally profit driven and that any they say it can't be done responsibly that's that's a lie it is all possible that's how we've grown to this point i mean because we believe in the cause it's not only war but it's not only give me give me give me, give me production give me more this no it's people can feel uh, comfortable to work and if they are comfortable they're they're happy i think everybody's happy to work with us here at groceries nobody wants to be with a family here the thing, honestly, I'm most proud of is walking in here and seeing these employees. It really is the human impact that I am most proud of. Yenny came to us through a referral. She's a lovely person. She has a great attitude. She's very talented. And as I got a little bit more familiarity with her and got to know her a little bit more, she shared her story of coming from a really negative experience. Government worker is high-skilled workers. Not everyone can do it. For me, it's like beauty, like art. I want like spectacular fashion for Lady Gaga. I think she want to, <laughs> she want wait. <laughs> My team gives me their all every day they come to work. It's just a matter of investing in people. I'm proud of this business as we are now, but I feel like we have a lot of room. So in the next year, we're rolling out a work ownership model where my team will be my partners. By having them be owners with me, it kind of shows the ultimate transparency. And I think that transparency is really key to solving a lot of these issues. We can't ever stop trying to understand how our goods are being made and what our supply chains look like. A lot of fashion customers, they don't, they don't want to know a story. They don't want to know process, production and everything. Oh, I don't care about that. I want the cheap clothing. But I was uh, a victim until this place. I'm survivor right now. As a consumer and to other consumers, I would want to say, your voice is really important. We can support Made in America, but we want to know that they have challenged that part of their supply chain. We need buyers to be committed to purchasing responsibly. I think if we help people to understand the issues with fast fashion, 
we can help people to ask imperative questions about where are my clothes made, how are the people treated. It's so important that we get to that point. Labor is not a liability. It's something that you need to cultivate and care for. And whether I'm talking to a young woman sewer in India, or I'm talking to an older man here sewing in LA, they really do want the same thing. They want to be able to work with dignity. We all want that. You're getting my tears going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, this is why we never try to tell the story on behalf of the workers, but we want the makers like Yeni to tell the story themselves, you know, and on our site, we make there are lots and lots of other young voices of the women who make our clothes that you can discover. It's all open source. You can share with your friends um, and you can also discover better brands. And I think this sort of brings us to sort of the last, very quick, we've covered a lot of material here on, well, the third and final story. And that's really the story of all of us. And, and what can we do without being overwhelmed? And, and how can we make a difference? And so, and as I share my screen again here, when you think about, you know, your role um, as someone who cares about these issues very much, um, how do you feel that you show up in the movement and, and make a difference? <sighs> oh, it's, I'm watching the video and I can't help. Every time I see those, sh the shots where you just see like people walking down the street and there's like clothing and clothing and clothing. It makes me feel so icky on the inside because there's so much clothes in this world. But we need to continue to remember ourselves that by making our own choices and by talking to people and sharing these stories, and empowering others to make the same with similar choices, we are making a difference. Um, and so our actions do matter. But yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And I, you know, this is why I said the third and final story in some ways will be the most empowering of them all, because I think often, you know, we have this sensibility and it's something that brands have sold us that we have to fix the fashion industry as a consumer. And somehow if I consume better, depending on what's on my shopping cart, that's going to make a difference. But you know, when I think about what we can do in our individual roles, it really is as a citizen first. And for that, I wanted to offer you, you know, a case study of the power of our voice and how much that matters in the current coronavirus pandemic and beyond. So as I had shared, you know, at the start of this pandemic, every fashion brand, high street and luxury, canceled orders, workers were left high and dry. And so we launched this now viral pay up petition. And at that point, there was only a smattering of brands, four or five who had paid up. At this point, thanks to customer pressure, like all of you on this call, we have unlocked $22 billion off that 40 billion. You know, 270 people signed the petition. There's over 23 brands, all the way from a Levi's to a Gap to a Nike that have paid out. And when we did postpartums with some of these brands on well, what drove you? Honestly, it was the citizen voice because it's in COVID, as so much of a brand's reputation was living online, a lot of these brands, especially at the time of, you know, BLM protests were trying to talk about diversity and inclusion and how they're on the right side of history. And we just had our pay up campaigners take over their Instagram handles, their Twitter handles to say, don't pretend to stand for diversity when you don't pay your predominantly black and brown women that make the fashion industry. You know, don't pretend to care about sustainability when you have not paid up. And it was really through that relentless campaigning, voices of everyday people, and then influencers jumped on the bandwagon. And then we had some of fashion's greats like Cameron Russell and Amber Valletta, and we were all holding up these signs to say pay up. And it was amazing how Instagram became this place of virtual protest and this ability to really not let brands get away from it. And that was our power as citizens to really, you know, get money directly in the hands of workers when she was deciding between whether she could have three meals or two. And so one very active way for you all to be involved is to participate in the second part of our pay up 
campaigning. You know, Europe has just entered a second lockdown. The trade data shows that order volume looks nothing like it did last year. There's just been this precipitous drop in orders. And what that means is workers are bracing for a very difficult winter and spring. I just talked to our LA uh, garment worker community members and you know, they are literally going door to door and delivering emergency groceries. And workers who've been making our protective gear, our masks, have been paid less than three cents, four cents a mask. And so demanding that the fashion industry protect workers and keep them safe during the pandemic, this is where your voice matters. And Katrina can put the petition in the chat there. And you may think, what's the power of the petition? Well, it turns out that petitioning relentlessly and going after these brands has done a lot, especially in the pandemic. And I just want to highlight that because I feel like we always... Even myself, sometimes I'm like, I know I'm posting and I'm speaking up, but like, what does it matter? It does matter. You unlock $22 billion for garment workers. That's incredible. So we have power. We have power. And this is sort of our power as citizens in solidarity with garment workers. And I tell you, there were days that it was hard, especially as a tiny nonprofit, you know, where all women team up like, oh my gosh, this is so enormous. Can we do this? And the solidarity that we saw across citizen groups, across labor groups, across workers that were even being laid off from warehouses and retail here in the US saying, we stand in solidarity with the workers who haven't been paid their wages. And so, you know, to sum it up in terms of what, what can we do? And if you were to tell me in an elevator very quickly, what are the first things to do? Um, the first is really, you know, it comes down to breaking up with our overconsumption model. It turns out it makes us depressed. It makes us unhappy. You know, it's cluttering up our closets. It's going to go in the landfill anyway. And fast fashion in particular is very disempowering to women, whether it's the women who sell the product or whether it's the women who make it. The second is, as we're thinking about who to buy from, where to buy, as you saw in the LA short, there are brands that are trying to do it better. They're often smaller and more sustainable. On our site, we make that world, we have a brand directory. Different from any sustainable influencers is that we take no money from the corporate industry we take no money from fashion brands no affiliation so it's just based on are you thinking about the environment and human rights in an intersectional way who are the better brands when it comes to basics tops bottoms shoes dresses you can discover all of that there but i think most importantly for you all to think if you care about the industry to really think about yourself as a citizen rather than a consumer. If you have a Zara outfit or an H&M outfit, uh, you know, that's all you can afford right now, let go of the shame to AT's point and know that there are opportunities to both donate your time and money, especially at this time when garment workers around the world are really bracing for the difficult, most difficult economic crisis of their time for us to be standing in solidarity with them and to be making sure that brands do right by them. Is there anything you would add to this list? And before we open it up for questions. Uh, I would just say, I guess it's part of step one, but it's like breaking the stigma of fashion of like, we can reuse outfits over and over again. You know, he mentioned that in the video of like, I already posted on Instagram. So, you know, done with now, <laughs> like who cares, you know? So like, you know, just making it cool to be different. Um, it's like the biggest thing. I think shifting pop culture in that way it's also how we can make the biggest impact and like influencing, influencing those around us um, has a big impact as well. Absolutely. And one of the fun things, Anne and I, we did a collab with some of the wonderful role models um, showing us 10 ways to shop sustainably that we can put the link in the chat to watch because there are so many ways, big and small, that we can make a difference. But